we get things set into your head how you think that you can take and mold that person's life. No, you can give them the tools to help mold their lives. Mm-hmm. We can't do that for them. Welcome to the Relational Parenting Podcast. I'm Jennifer Hayes, a parent coach and 20 year childcare veteran. Each week, I sit down with my own father, Rick Hayes, and discuss the complicated issues that parents face today, as well as some of the oldest questions in the book. From the latest research and the framework of my relational parenting method, we offer thought-provoking solutions to your deepest parenting struggles. Added bonuses include intergenerational wounding discussions and guest childcare experts. We will also start taking your parenting questions in episode five. So be sure to comment with your biggest questions or email me directly at Jenny at JennyB.co. Let's get started. Claudette Osborne is passionate about the transformational power of coaching and changing limiting beliefs. Growing up, she faced struggles that impacted her relationships early in life, making her feel isolated. She overcame these challenges through self-evaluation, unconditional love, and personal growth and development. Claudette serves and supports parents with teenagers and blended families by helping participants discover life-changing shifts in thoughts and perspectives through her signature program, From Troubled to Triumphant, for parents seeking a happy relationship with their teens, spouse, and blended family. Claudette offers one online one-on-one and group coaching to meet your needs. She's a certified master life coach, founder of Power Perspective Coaching, co-founder of Osborne Stables Equine Rescue, and facilitator of her Connection Equine Assisted Skills Development Program, where all proceeds go to the care and needs of the horses. She sees everything as a gift and an opportunity. Hey guys, welcome back to the Relational Parenting Podcast. It's officially 2024. It's our first episode of the year and we are so excited to be back full swing releasing episodes every single week. Um, We hit a couple of snafus at the end of 2023 and one being that I got pregnant and got very, very sick. We had a few uh, guest cancellations and the holidays and lots of things going on, just like, just like everybody else during that season. So, but we are back, we are full throttle. Um, And I just wanted to pop in to say thank you so much for being here with us for our first full year. Um, you know, being on, being existing in the podcast realm and we're back for a second year. We've got so many new ideas and things and guests lined up for 2024. So I hope you'll stick around with us. Uh, and last but not least in this episode, unfortunately my camera and microphone shut down. I lost Wi-Fi in the last about five minutes of the episode. So Um, I very suddenly disappear, um, but my dad wraps up with Claudette very beautifully, and I hope that you guys enjoy the episode. Uh, Welcome back, everybody, to the Relational Parenting Podcast. Happy New Year. Um, This is our first episode of 2024, and Papa Rick is here with me, and we have our first guest of the year, Claudette Osborne, and she is here with us um, from Texas, right? Yes. Yes, from your equine rescue. Um, and what do you call what, where you're at on a ranch? Well, it's a 33-acre little piece, so most people anywhere else would call it a ranch. It's We would call it just a large acreage. If okay. you weren't in Texas, yeah. Right. If you're not in Texas, it's probably a small ranch. Yeah. Yeah. So, so we are back. I just want to say for the first of the year, we're, we're back. Um, and I'm going to do a separate intro for, for some more details. So people have probably already heard this. Um, but we're, we're doing some new things. We've got some new things coming up in the podcast. Um, and, and yeah, we've got guests every single week lined up and we're, yeah, we're back to back and we're excited. And I think I announced this on the last episode, but I am also pregnant. 
Um, mm. So I am 20, week, 20, 20 weeks and 20. some number of days. And <laughs> so we're halfway there. And so we're making all of the plans for my maternity leave as well. So we'll be recording extra episodes and uh, so that we can release while I'm still, while I'm not live recording. So anyway, happy new year, everybody. I hope everyone got through their holiday season with as little scarring and trauma as possible. <laughs> Hopefully with mostly, mostly enjoyment and fun and connection. And um, we're happy to be back. So, um, so welcome officially, Claudette. Thank you so much for being here. We're so excited hey. to to chat with you today. Hi. Hey. Nice to meet you both. And thank you so much for having me on your show. I've been so looking forward to this. Awesome. Me too. Me too. So Claudette, tell us a little bit about what you do. You you rescue horses, but you also work with um, youth and kind of how how you came about doing that kind of work. Mm. Well, I've worked with children most of my life and uh, ended up somewhat raising or helping to assist to raise my siblings. But kids have been in my life off and on, and horses have been in my life most of my life. Um, the work that I do here, one is partnering with the horses through the equine rescue, these horses were high risk, their last chance of survival. Uh, it's all veterinary mm -hmm. referral and law enforcement referral. Mm -hmm. So we're not getting wow. healthy horses. Mm -hmm. So rehabbing and getting them back, some of them go back to riding status, but that usually is short-lived. Um, their injuries mm -hmm. catch up with them. But as we started the rescue, what I found was as many people that came to help or were aware of the rescue came there to get their needs met mm. and they needed that rescue as much as the horses yeah. did. Yeah. Um, the training with the horses also having a trauma focused training and uh, how the horses act, react, behave, how they react to stimuli, uh, people's emotions, their thoughts, their actions, uh, they're a good barometer. I can watch the horse and pretty much tell where the person is and mm -hmm. that way help them see cool. where they were, maybe were at that moment. But the programs we do partnering with the horse all go directly to the equine rescue for their care and needs. And the coaching piece that is virtual one-on-one -on -one and group coaching, that is a separate company. So okay. we, Osborne Staples Equine Rescue is the charity and nonprofit that we co-founded, my husband and I. Okay. And Powerful Perspective Coaching is the coaching business, which reaching outside of the horse realm, I still use a lot of horse analogies <laughs> because it's <laughs> easy to yeah. paint the pictures and get that emotion because sure. they're big animals. They, you know, a lot of people have ingrained in their head what they think they are like. And when they find out how they actually work and think, they start to look at how they work and think. It's pretty neat. I think horses are such, I mean, horses have been used therapeutically for decades. And something, like I grew up, you know, I went to horse camp. I was around horses. My husband and I periodically, like for fun, we'll go ride horses. We do have a dream someday to own horses, but, um, you know, I, I have never worked with a horse therapeutically, but every time I'm around one, I real, I recognize it's like forces me to see how small I am <laughs> when you're around, you know, I have dogs, I've, I've had cats, I've had, like, I've had pets and I'm, very well versed in animals and and things like that. But when you approach an animal that is that big and powerful and unmoving, you really don't have a choice other than to respect it and treat it mm -hmm. like you don't have power over it. <laughs> and 
and there's there's a fine line because with horses you still I mean there's like to break a horse or to ride a horse you have to kind of like be in charge you have to be confident you have to be in charge you have to know where you want the horse to go etc so that they listen to you so that they respect you but I think that a horse is such a massive animal that it that it is the perfect mirror for our own fears or sense of ego or Mm. whatever, because it all just goes away. When you walk up to an animal that could like kill you with one kick or throw you off or, you know, any of these things, it just, it just changes how you approach them. Changes the dynamic. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Several things you just said there, you know, how I can take that alone. The, yes, they're powerful and they can kick and they can do these things. But the way they, they act, react, and think, they don't see us as anything but a two-legged animal. Mm-hmm. They're a four-legged animal. They want to know who's higher in the pecking order, them or us, and yeah. where's the leadership, where's the herd leadership coming from. Yeah. And the old school beat up training was to break the horse as well. Yeah. Where if you're looking at how they operate and you are going to partner with them and get them to trust and not be fearful that you are that predator animal. Eyes in front of the head were the predator animal. They're the prey animal. Eyes are in the sides. Yeah. So their visions are looking for that. It's kind of like the person who's the hypervigilant waiting for the next shoe to fall sometimes. Mm-hmm. Their little radar mm-hmm. dishes are on all the time. So they're yeah. always scanning. They're not necessarily, you're there and you think they're with you. And I can look at the horse and he's he's escaped. He's over there with his herd listening to them while the person is, oh, pretty horse and this is wonderful. <laughs> and the horse has checked out on them. Yeah. But, you know, a lot of times they're, they're not truly really present or that fear, that little anxiety that's there. The horse instantly doesn't quite feel as safe. So mm-hmm. it's, it's attention is going to go somewhere else. Interesting. Interesting. Um, it's fun to watch. We've got one 2000 pound percher on that. Oh we did Lord. a pilot program with a, the um, alternative school and some of the ones that have been the aggressor are bullies. And I put them with specific horses and stuff. The horse moved just, just a little bit to the side. This one kid, he leaped <laughs> over the, the panel to get on the other side, it scared the cheevers <laughs> out of it. And, and you know, you can't, you don't want to crack up, but you do smile. Yeah. And they were, what just happened? And they give you the feelings of what just happened with them and why yeah. that was so frightening. I said, okay, so have you ever been in a position where you think somebody else would have maybe felt the same way? Yeah. Oh, my God. <laughs> It's, mm-hmm. it's fun to watch. I mean, I shouldn't say fun, but it brings things to life that are hard to get people to see. Yeah. Mm-hmm. They've got to experience and feel this for themselves. That's why they call it experiential learning. Yeah. Um, experiential learning. Yeah. And being hands-on, usually when you're around them, as Jenny was saying, when you're around it, you feel a little calmer and at, at peace. Their heart rate is slower. A magnetic mm. field of the heart rate is going to affect ours oh, just yeah, like ours yeah. when that anxiety comes up and we get a little fearful and our heart rate goes up, yeah. it's going to affect them. Yeah. Very interesting. It's, I wrote so, a little bit as a kid, but this is really interesting stuff. I was too young to understand that. Um, that's really interesting. The And the different perspective. You're, you, when you're dealing with other people, you kind of have expectations, but to, you'd be able to learn things from a horse because it just because it's, it's different. And But have somebody draw the parallels. That's really interesting. Well, they can't plot. They can't plan. They can't think it out. They can yeah. act or react. They can feel safe or not. <laughs> you know, it's, it's a very simplistic. They don't have the frontal neocortex, they don't have the frontal processing that we do. Get rid of some of the They live in the brainstem. They, they live in the trauma brain. Yeah. Oh. So. Just, I can't resist drawing this line to children. Um, you said a few minutes ago 
you were talking about the old school way of breaking a horse was to break its will. Mm-hmm. Um, Just like and s- parenting. Raising, mm-hmm. raising children too. Yeah. <laughs> and a lot of parenting is teaching the child who's in charge Yeah, and a lot of old school parenting. Um, and the new, what, you know, with new research, new information, um, you said two, you said two words, you, you, um, create trust with the horse and you lead the horse. And all I can think about is what we talk about on the show with how to parent your children is that you're, you're a team, you're creating trust that you're not the threat to your child and you're not using harsh mechanisms, fear, shame, guilt to break their will to just obey, but you're actually leaning in and working together and getting earning each other's trust. And then you're also stepping into a leadership role where you're not afraid and where you are capable of handling big emotions or whatever else may come along that children might have, because they do live in the brainstem. They're like until they're fully developed or more developed as they grow in their prefrontal cortex, they are reactive creatures. They, Mm -hmm. all they do is live in, Action and reaction. What is my environment doing? Am I safe? Am I safe? Yeah. They make yeah. that distinction sometimes in the military, the difference between being a leader and a, and a boss or a manager or something more authoritarian. Being a leader is a different thing, learning to be a leader. And the new studies on that have come out, too, with the corporate as far as how the handling of things, um, <laughs> knowing where the responses are coming from you know why corporate teams fail often and mm-hmm. the, where mm-hmm. they're putting the pressure and it, is that coming from where the the judge of what they think the situation is or not involving those team members or you know developing that relationship just like you're trying to do with raising the kids you're trying with to kids. develop them into people who are going to be responsible parents as they get older I know by watching and knowing how, like my dad was raised, you know, definitely didn't know and only worked off of how they were, how he was raised. And plus when you don't learn to handle those pressures, you end up dishing out the same thing you grew up with right away. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It's yeah. it's just a followed, it's a known pattern. It's what you know. It's a default. And that crazy amygdala mm-hmm. just if hijacked you your brain. Yeah. Yeah, if you don't recognize it as unhealthy or undesirable for some reason, then it becomes your your model too, you know. Mm-hmm. Your view of the world is ninety percent of who you are hanging out with and that's who you're you're forced to be around you know yeah. so you learn a lot of things that you sometimes have to be and done but as coaches what we're we're definitely not looking back at that i mean you may just there may be a mention or somebody says something about that is okay now today what's going on today how does that you know mm. affect now and how do we move forward from here and working on those building block pieces um being our first show here at the new year, everybody made resolutions. Mm-hmm. The resolution's just the end big picture. Yeah. The intention mm-hmm. comes with steps and paths to get you there and making the adjustments when things don't work out, they're not failures, they're adjust pieces that are, cause you to adjust. Most people say, oh, well, they quit, they give up on the goal or they give up because it failed. Mm-hmm. No, you had a bend in the road and you just took a different road. So we may have to find our way back with a different path. Yeah. But yeah. looking at the big picture hmm. too soon without a pathway, it's kind of hard to get there. Yeah. So those goals it's fail. So you kind of have to just recognize, be aware. Is that a mindfulness thing to be aware when something's not working and then work on techniques to do it different? and not spend too much time ruminating or 
or psychotherapize it, you know, don't yeah. go back and worry about your mother's upbringing and, you know, let's just figure out, okay, that's not good. And let's go forward from here. What's, what's a, let's try something different. No, we're, we're not here to medicalize things. You know, coaches are not professional counselors. They are not okay. psychologists that when you see that need in someone you refer out. Yeah. Okay. But you can give, yes, the awareness that mindfulness and awareness, it's hard to make change in your life if you're not aware of, of what's what's amiss or why you're doing what you're doing. You just have done it that way all your life. Was well, it still serving you? That horse scared me. That big horse scared me, and I yelled at him, and he still didn't do what I wanted him to do. Maybe I need to try another tack. Well, maybe they need to also step back and get control of <laughs> their emotions before mm-hmm. they even ask that horse to be a partner. There you go. Avoid and the curve. No, don't go into the curve too fast. <laughs> you, yeah, you know, the horse is going to take off and you're going to spend your time ticked off and chasing them. And all that's going to happen is you're going to stay ticked off and the horse is going to say, hey, I'm out of here. That, that human's a scary animal. I can outrun you all day, two-legged person. Right. <laughs> when I, and in that situation, often the horse gets blamed by that person, oh. right? Mm-hmm. Like this horse just doesn't listen. This horse just has issues. This horse just wants to be a pain in the ass. And it's like, well, oh. hmm. no, you yelled at it. A natural response to being yelled at is to get away <laughs> from that person. <laughs> so, but yeah, there's a lot of people who grow up learning to blame the circumstance instead of take responsibility for their response to the circumstance. Yeah. Absolutely. And we do that. Then we do that to our kids. Mm-hmm. But, um, so Claudette, how, so you, in your coaching practice, are you directly coach? I know that you've worked with, um, at risk youth, a lot in your history. Are you working directly with youth right now or is your coaching more geared towards parents and families? It's family. It's the okay. parents and the teenagers because a lot of people have already written the teenagers off. Yeah. The behavior has, the parents have thrown their hands up. They want specific things and specific behaviors from the mm-hmm. team. And like I said, there's no pathway. There, the frustration has taken over. The communication has shut down. Uh, how do you get the communication back open? Mm-hmm. How do you get that trust back into play, whether it's lack of trust on either end? Uh, learning how to actively listen. Um, how to seek compromise instead of a hard line, you have to do what I say or else. <laughs> Is there a win-win? Yeah, it always works. (laughs) Is that win-win, you know, such a hard thing. And, you know, there are a lot of things at play. You've got professional parents working that have their jobs, their stresses, their things. They want to excel at that. I don't feel like a good parent. I don't feel like I'm making any headway. I don't know where they're coming from. Mm -hmm. And they won't talk to me. Mm Mm-hmm. Okay, well, then how do we get them? How do we do this? And by giving them a little focus exercises, but it starts, they want to fix the child. Mm -hmm. (laughs) It's hard to fix anybody without taking a hard look at where you are. So they'll tell me the stories and you, it's, you need to not get caught up in the story. Because it's not yeah. so much about the story as it is. Why is that important that that happened that way? Yeah. And get them to where they're working and happy with where they're at. Get the teen working and understanding to be more independent. Be, find their voice again. Yeah. 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 Make it an actual team where everybody's moving in the same direction instead of corralling everybody and forcing them to do things. That's a that's kind of a new paradigm. I hate to use that word. Um, from I I remember when I was raising kids, seeing ads for 
courses where they would they would teach you how to fix your kids. You know, are they having trouble at school? Right? It was really like, you know, well, there, it comes with a baseball bat and a, you know, I remember yeah. even mm-hmm. marveling at that point about the authoritarian kind of thing as opposed to what you're talking about. It's Claudette, still in play today. Building, I'm sure it's out. <laughs> it's still There's very everything prevalent. out there. Yeah. It's, you know. it's very much in play. Um, yeah. Most of the biggest problems uh, is they won't do this. They won't do that. They, I can't get them to do this. And it's, Some of some control, some ego, some hyper vigilant, some hyper excel, some hyper you know, those became our protection devices. They can be our best friend and our worst enemy. But mm-hmm. unless you can identify when it pops in, is that my voice of wisdom? Is that my voice of judgment mm-hmm. before they pop off to what and how things are supposed to happen? It can make a big gotta, difference in communication. You've got to listen to that third person. We've we've got a, a friend that uh, um, she's a grand she's a grandmother. She's raising her five grandkids and trying to make a living, uh, working two or three jobs. And you know her mind is just. We were just talking. I was just talking with her with my partner this morning, and it's she's just so busy, just trying to get through the days. You know, she had, there's very little mind share for was mm-hmm. that the right thing to do? Because the next thing comes along, you know, before uh, before you get to it. And so sometimes that's a real challenge. It would I'm going to have to send her to equine therapy. That sounds like a real Texas is a little far away, but to get her out of her own house and environment and give her a chance, even with the kids, you do families. Did I read that right? Uh, yeah. Families, you have whole corporate, families show up? Absolutely. And ours, it's, it's equine assisted learning, not therapy here. I'm sorry, <laughs> equine assisted learning. <laughs> that's okay. Sorry, I, I just I had to buzz in on that. I medicalize everything. Yes. I know, but yes. the, see, that's one of our problems. Very um, good. Very, everything. Yeah. Teach me. My child has anxiety. My child has the, my, yeah. I have anxiety. Are we anxious about this or that? Are we stressed okay. over it? Or is it, has, the world becomes so medicalized that everything has yeah, to run to the doctor is. and get a medication to try to to do a quick fix buzz over my life will be good as long as yeah or it'll be good when i get to this point or when yeah. let's let's get that joy and happiness in as being good right now right now with, and that little finding the pieces now that we can look at yeah. I mean, go outside, listen to the leaves blowing and the, yeah, the get birds, out of it. Change your something to out of get it. out of our heads. Well, I think that two, two things, the over, the over medicalization is, I mean, there's just so many parts of children that they're just, it's just their personality. And, and, and I think we walk into parenting like with these expectations of how children should be or should behave or should excel or should reach milestones. And it's like every person, every human on earth is a completely different human being. Like no one is, is we're all on a spectrum in every facet of our lives, emotionally, mentally, like, we like we are all going to develop at different rates at different times and just cuz my this your kid isn't doing the same things that your other kid is or that other kids their age are doing doesn't mean there's anything wrong with them and yeah everything is just hyper diagnosed as something mm-hmm. as a as a problem to be fixed and so so that but then the other thing dad that you were saying about um about the difficulty of um, the grandma who's raising her grandchildren, which in and of itself is um, a a less common situation. But but I think there's a lot of parents, single parents, partnered parents, blended families, whoever it is, everyone is busy. Everyone has a million things they're trying to get done in a day. And... And when you add kids to the mix, 
especially multiple children who have different schedules and different needs and different personalities yeah. and different dietary restrictions and all of these different things. Yeah. Like I think a lot of people are in survival mode yeah. because mm-hmm. there is no downtime. There is no pause. There is no like, let's just walk out around outside with no purpose mm-hmm. other than to be mm-hmm. breathe fresh air and be together. Like that is so lacking in today's society and structure and everything is so go, go, go all of the time. And if, I mean, if you're a single person working multiple jobs to feed your kids, I mean, there, there's no time for you. Yeah. There's probably no, not enough time for you to get a good night's sleep, No self-care. let alone yeah. eat a good meal and think about your life. It's just like got on to the next thing because I have to, we have to survive. Yeah, busyness and agendas. I think it, I think um, uh, the word just popping out of all this to me is is parents have agendas, right? We got to be to mm-hmm. church on time. We gotta we gotta do this and the bus and the busyness, you know. So you can only cram so much of that in there. There's no, there's only so much time for just walking around and smelling the roses too. So that's you know we got to find a way to get a balance on that. Um, when you don't have that time. There, that's a, the techniques of taking five, three minutes, four times a day, mm-hmm. spaced out. Hmm. Whether it's the breathing or awareness or a sense of hearing, touch, whatever it is, to mm-hmm. refocus yourself before you. If you don't, that's part of self care too. People think you say people say self care all the time. And I think mm-hmm. a lot of people misread that is, and everybody should be going to get a facial massage. <laughs> no, <laughs> and not everybody has a life of, of luxury and leisure, but the, your alarm can go off at six o'clock in the morning and you can set a secondary alarm for 15 minutes later. Yeah. Spend that whole 15 minutes doing nothing but purposefully breathing. Yeah. Yeah. Do a little meditation or, or something. Hearing you know. and not, you know, just that you take that. They said, I don't have time to do this. Yeah. Well, everybody eats and everyone goes to the restroom and let's see, focus on the taste of the food as you're chewing it. Those are our senses. Focus on the crunchy. It's, do you know you can get those times in to get yourself recentered mm-hmm. by you know it's very small it seems insignificant mm-hmm. but mm-hmm. most people are going to barrel through the meals because I don't have time so they shove down the food um, I can't do this because okay can you rub your fingers together and feel your fingertips. Can you actually yeah. focus on on something short of what's in your head? Just focus on a feel. Mm-hmm. A few times a day is going to at least get you out of your head, get you rebalanced, and give you a way to start to look at things a little differently. Mm-hmm. So is that, can you describe that, could I describe that as being like going internal kind of, you know, becoming, focusing yeah. on Foc- your sense? Um, or Awareness. It, awareness. Awareness. Um, it's kind of like the person comes out of them. I t- teach this with the kids and the girls. They come out of the mall. They've got their phone in one hand and their keys mm-hmm. are in their bag and mm-hmm. they are obliviously walking through life mm-hmm. and they don't know what's around them. If anyone's around them, mm-hmm. their little world gets so narrow and boxed in they can't mm-hmm. see outside of that. So when some problem comes up, they're still looking in that little box because they haven't been taught to look outside of things. But it starts with being aware. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Levels of awareness. That's my, I almost that's think of... it's more external because I, I feel like we all live hmm. in here. Yeah, and... That's to get you out of your head. These exercises yeah. actually mm-hmm. get you out of thinking and more out of actually have a feel to things versus Feeling. thinking about it. it it's things. an it, yeah it's a hands-on mm-hmm. awareness but when mm-hmm. you can do that then what that leads into is being conscious of our thoughts when they pop into our head well that mm-hmm. was kind of a negative thought oh that was 
there goes the judge. And once you realize that's what Mm -hmm. you've done, then -hmm. you can look at it differently. But all of a sudden, if that's a habit that has been formed that every time you turn around judging this, that, the other, it, yeah. that can, habit's going to get stronger. Yeah. It's ways that's to probably break one of the most, habits. Yeah. Yeah. Having habits and, and self-talk, you know, that, that voice, uh, your own voice in your head, that's got to be one of the hardest ones to break, you know, because it's so common, it's so so pervasive right there. You really do have to be aware, become aware of the thoughts as they go by and say, yeah, that was not the most desirable thought. I can think of a better thought. Well, I'm believing your thoughts. Mm-hmm. There's, there's having thoughts, there's labeling the thoughts, and then there's do I believe this thought mm-hmm. that as as the thought comes into my head or as the story about the situation that i was in starts to wind itself through my brain can you catch that and go do i actually believe that that's what happened or do or is it reality that that's what happened or you know can there's there's a we have what i think over 60,000 thoughts a day or something like that. And like, if you're, is that what it was? I forget what the number was, but then there's a certain percentage of those thoughts that are repetitive. (laughs) So you're not having any new thoughts. You're having some new thoughts every day, but most, the majority, and I forget the percent, I'll have to look up the number. Um, But the majority of our thoughts that we have every day are the same. They're repetitive. And so there are stories Mm. that we have come to believe um, through repetition based on our environment and our experience and to be capable of pausing and reflecting and choosing our thought like that takes practice. And even like you said, if you can take three minutes a few times a day when right when you wake up, when you eat lunch, when you eat dinner, and right before bed, if you can set a timer for three minutes and just reflect or pause and breathe or whatever, do a, do a feeling. My, my therapist would tell me to um, put both of my feet flat on the ground. She's like, mm-hmm. sit in a chair, stand up, whatever it is. But just for three minutes, all you're going to think about is how the ground feels against your feet. Get grounded, yeah. That's it. And so it was like an external feeling to focus on and it would, it would pull me out of the hamster wheel. Right. Mm -hmm. But yeah, it takes, it's not just going to happen. You have to, you have to want to do it and work on it. You have to want it and a little bit of discipline to keep it going. Building mental muscle. Here we are back to the first of the year. Everybody's hitting the gym. You think you're going to go to the gym once or twice and come out the way you want to be. Mm-mm. The same mental muscle building, doing exercises like this to strengthen that is going to give you that ability to recognize the thoughts, to recognize mm-hmm. the things and make changes. Is it, like I said, is it still relevant today? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Is, it is this a belief? Back? Is this a belief from when I was seven? that I still carry today and can I, do I want to still believe this? Or like you said, does this serve me anymore? No. Okay. Let's change Mm -hmm. that story. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Call it goop. The good opinion of other people. We wait around in it and suck the boots right off of you. You know, the good good opinion of other people. And sometimes it becomes our opinion, (laughs) not, and it, it was someone else's. We we stole it. <laughs> you know, we, we need to not be little brain thieves, you know. Just yeah, yeah. yeah. I love Form. little acronyms like that. It, it it makes it easy to retain a more complicated, you know, a reminder of a more complicated thought, useful thought. Well, how often have you? Has it rained outside and you've walked out in the mud and it almost pulled your shoes off? <laughs> mm. And the same feel with playing in the good opinion of other people. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Sometimes it just sucks the energy right out of you. 
Yeah. You adopted, how many children did you adopt? Well, they weren't my adopted children. My husband's daughter was adopted and she came to live with us shortly after Mm. he and I were married. Okay. And um, so I have been what I call a surrogate parent, which, you know, having not been there, but Mm. I've had the privilege of having a lot of young people in my life. Uh, well, but no, they're not kids. my adopted children. But I, and even some of our volunteers that have been with us for a very long time, you know, I consider them mine as well. You know, they're sure. not. Yeah. But, you know, when things happen in their lives, they call. Um, I've had a couple of the boys and even ones that have come through community service that have called me. Can I come by? I've got a friend I want you to meet. Oh, and, okay. and that was like. Oh, you know, because yeah. you were there during a hard part of their life. And when they come in here, I don't care where they've been. I don't care what they've done. And it's a clean slate. And here we are. Let's go. Yeah. And taking time and just letting them be heard and feel that's comfortable. A, that's a- you know? That's a good application of good opinion of other people. You just have to be careful who the people are. Yeah, I mean, right? you, you need to be wise. Bringing somebody by to see that's that's a very that's a great compliment. Yeah, you need to be wise to you know know you know who 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 is who, but at the same time, again, if we let our judge rule our brain, people are going to cook up in their head what they think somebody is or isn't. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And we don't know that. Mm -hmm. You know, they've been in a different place. I use the analogy of the glasses. You know, your daughter's not going to be able to take your glasses and look at them, look through them and see the same way you do. Right. Mm -hmm. You know, we're none of us going to be able to look at a situation the same way. Yeah. Most of us are not qualified to judge other people. Well, we, we really, I mean, it's empathize, but judging that situation, no, you're, yeah. you're not, people say, I'll walk a mile in their shoes. Yeah. But you're not walking in their shoes as them. Yeah. Yep, it's tough. So at least give them, give them that space. Well, so it they sounds mess like up. you they they've got their own things they'll have to work through if they mess that up. The door is clean slate and is open. They mess yeah. that up, the accountability piece comes in. Yeah. Yeah. So it sounds like you you you, you seem careful about calling yourself a parent, but it sounds like you've parented a lot of different kids in some capacity or Another. Yeah. I mean, that's a real broad experience. And I remember seeing uh, you fostered too, right? Yes, I mean, we did. Formally fostered. How, what What can you tell us about that in parenting? Well, I think a lot of parents have big expectations of what they think they can bring in. Everyone wants to do well and wants to do the right thing and give these children the best chance, the best home, the best opportunity the better school from where they've been, give them. But a lot of the same parents have expectations that that, that person's going to be able to excel to that level. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. Not, you know, knowing, not again, knowing where they've been. Um, also, there are some awarenesses that you blindly don't want to see that you know where they are. And mm. it's not that you build walls, but Again, you have to be wise and know how to handle what, where they've been. Yeah. Helping them move forward, not backwards. But some of the kids are going to be challenged with those things for a very long time. And just because they come into someone's house as a foster or a late life adoption or something, you know, Expect that it can cause some upheaval in the family. Mm-hmm. It's not going to no always way. be any more than your biological children. You're going to have that. 
and just you can't expect, well, I've given them this and this and they should be grateful and they should be happy and they should be should, should, shoulds. Who should was that? Yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. it is a big step and it it's good and it's wonderful to do. Just know that you help them be a more productive person to go out on their own and make their way and not with the expectation that I'm going to give them this and they're going to love me for life. And, you know, yeah. going yeah. into things with big expectations can set up a lot of heartache. Expectation well, and giving control. with the expectation of return. Yeah. Is you, also, you don't do this for love. I mean, not to receive it back. If you are doing right. it to receive it back, then you're not truly giving that gift. Yeah. yeah. You're, it's strings attached. And it's the same. Yeah. It's the oh. same in any partnership, friendship, parent, really like parent to child relationship, whether it's biological or fostered or adopted or any situation like you're, you are gifting, you're gifting life to biological Mm -hmm. children. You're gifting safety and a different kind of life to foster and adopted children. You're gifting your love and trust and faith to um, a partner or a friend um, because you see in them something that you value. And, but if you're only, like you said, if you're only giving those things in order to get it back. Like you're, that's still just you meeting your own needs. You're not in relationship. You're not in healthy relationship with any of those people. Um, And I see all the time, I see parents reaching this, this image comes this, doing this to their kids. Like, I've, I've loved them. I've fed them. I've clothed them. They like, almost like they owe me kind of thing. Um, I've heard that even said out loud, but you yeah. Know. Unabashedly uh, say it out loud. Yeah. I've heard it said out loud. Yeah. <laughs> and But they owe me. You owe me. Wow. Um, That's not why we have kids. No. Well, That's why some people have kids. <laughs> well, unfortunately, I think they, yeah pop in and oh. think they need something to love them back. And yeah, I'm flashing back on, uh, on, uh, the, the greatest generation or where I'm, I'm flashing back on, I'm a, I'm a, a, a farmer. Uh, my wife and I rode a Conestoga wagon out to the West and mm-hmm. started a horse ranch. And <laughs> I am having kids to have farm hands by golly. You know, I'm, I'm, yeah, I mean, the old fashioned, uh, I don't know how stereotypical or how accurate that is, but then it's like, I need you to perform young and go, go clean out the stalls. You know, I ain't got time for this kind of stuff. And then the, and then the, and I fed you and I housed you and I clothed you and to have an expectation of your kids, that's kind of a frame of mind kind of thing. Cause it is a gift, you know, to parent. To parent mm-hmm. kids is a gift to the planet, kind of. But that, if I was struggling to survive out in the middle of the prairie in the 1800s, that might be a little hard to look at it that way, you know, the way we do now. Times are different. Well, the world was mm-hmm. different. The needs were different. Yeah, well, and survival was it's different. a little gentler. That was, yeah, you yeah. had to do a lot of that to survive then. We've got a lot of creature comforts now, and that is not today's survival. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Things are different. It's not quite a, uh, you know, we're not just out in in the environment with a spear trying to fend off the mountain lions. You know, it's time to, uh, for parenting to evolve a little bit, too. But I also think that there's an element of that that's missing where kids are participating in in the building of the life and the maintaining of the home, just because we're not all farmers in the middle of nowhere anymore, 
I think that because of the creature comforts, we send our children into the living room to watch TV while we cook dinner or while we clean the house, we clean during nap time or, you know, we, we, we put our children, we other our children, um, instead of pulling them into, I mean, I've watched one year olds help unload a dishwasher Mm-hmm. And they love it because they think they're playing with you. They think they get to do this big kid thing with mommy or daddy. They, I've watched children choose to do laundry over play a game. I have watched, like, they want to be part of life. They don't want to be othered. They don't want to be, you go do this while I do this. Mm-hmm. And I'm not saying that there's not a time or place for that, but when children, you know, I imagine back then it was a lot about survival, but the kids participated in the life of the family. Mm -hmm. And I think that's missing in a lot of homes these days is that kids are not given the chance to help and assist because it's, it feels like a burden to have to teach constantly or to have to do something over again if they spill something while they're cooking or they break a plate or whatever, you know, whatever. We're trying so hard to avoid messiness Mm -hmm. that we end up excluding our children from the household and the chores and Mm -hmm. things like that. Imperfection. Well, they need, they need that. That is too much has been given in today's society. Yeah. And you're not teaching. I mean, a lot of these young girls have been taken care of and boys too, but Sure. How many of these boys are going to grow up and be able to take care of these girls in the fashion they were raised in, in today's world? <laughs> uh, it's a concern. And it's a haven't concern. had to make a yeah. bed or, or do chores. And it mm-hmm. shouldn't all be given. You know, yeah. that earned respect is not just in respect. It's in teaching them how to take care of and build their own lives. And mm-hmm. they're not yes. going to pop out and be able to go hire a maid. Mm-hmm. When they yeah. leave, mm-hmm. they're going to have to have some life skills. Yeah. Or, or they'll expect to be able to hire a maid and find out they don't have the money and then they're mm-hmm. unhappy, right? And now we're, now we're chasing the dollar. That's, a, that's all aspects of team building. You know, team America, since the industrial, since post-World War II, we all think we're like identical little cogs in a machine, and we're not. Teams are made up of different people with complementary skills, and the trick, especially of the leader of the team, is to figure out, okay, are you ready to pull the cups, the plastic? You can unload the plastic stuff out of the dishwasher. Mm -hmm. Leave the china, leave the stemware. I'll do the stemware. (laughs) You know, but Mm -hmm. you you have to develop them. And and let them do what they can do, you know. Figure out what's what's appropriate, but but you have to be you have to be focused on developing them, growing yeah. them to to do that. You can't just be in a hurry and worried about how long it takes to unload the, the dishwasher. That's not the point. Yeah. If you're doing this the way we're talking about doing it, and the Give Me Society hasn't helped anyone. No. No. no, but we're not supposed to work so hard, though, that we think that love's wrapped around what we earn. So it, that ba- yeah. you know that little line of, yes, you have to definitely grow you know, through the through the work, through the chores. So but fostering, I can hardly love in between. Yes, yes, the love, the the that's where the want to wanting to give, wanting uh, comes from is that uh, that unconditional love. You know, with boundaries, of course, you know. Oh, absolutely. People misunderstand that unconditional love thing, too. You know, you you have to sometimes not, you've got to be able to not play where others play when it's detrimental. Yeah. Yeah. So fostering, that's, I, I considered fostering after my kids grew up and left home. I really miss raising kids. I I really enjoyed raising kids and not doing it perfectly, but but trying, and but fostering kids out of horrible circumstances it's potentially, tough. you know, and bringing them into your family and doing this with them that that strikes me as that could be an enormous. They come and go, you know, as as the system may dictate, and that just strikes me as an enormous challenge. I have so much respect for people who who 
foster. And you seem like you've done a lot of, you fostered well, we, a we lot of kids. we did a few. The, just a, a, a few? couple that we did that okay. actually were going to, we were going to adopt. Hmm. And had to be willing and ready when when they had a different vision of how they wanted their life to be, whether they were prepared or ready okay. or not, to let go. <laughs> That's when you again when you want better for people, mm-hmm. but you've got to understand they're they're still going to make choices and skin some knees, and some take a harder path than others. Yeah. And again, that you have to be willing to step back. When Do you mean that, that they ends. were they they didn't want to be adopted? Oh, they they wanted as they're older. Mm-hmm. A lot of people have learned the system so well that they want out of the system. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah, and they want a path to independent living on their own. And yeah. you're a stepping stone to that in yeah. a lot of mm-hmm. cases. Yeah. So, you know, it appears, you know, everybody gets really good at saying what they want and what other people, they think other people want to hear. Yeah. Yeah. So you have to be prepared to not, you know, still be kind hearted and, and know that, that, uh, that there can be some bruises along the way. That's got to be tough, yeah. You know, because there are times where that may have worked out into an adoptive situation, and it may not have, depending if you're considering fostering. It is a wonderful thing to do. Um, Just know that the bowl of cherries that you set on the table that you're going to provide may not feed them in the way you think it's going to. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Expectations again. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, that's we hard get work. Things set into your head how you think that you can take and mold that person's life. No, you can give them the tools to help mold their lives. Mm-hmm. We can't do that for them. Mm-hmm. Well, that's true with any kid, any no, person, anybody. You can't fix people. Yeah, and, but that's one of the reasons I chose to work with families and teenagers and blended families. Because you know, you've got a lot of dynamics coming in. You've got multi-households, and people are going in different directions. The communication is shot. Yeah. Find ways that you can open those doors and build the communication back. What and a challenge. There are many, many tools to do it. So did you learn them along the way? Did you go to college for 15 mm-hmm. years? How did yeah. you, you learn these schools? <laughs> Uh, some of them went through the horses. Some of them went through coaching programs. Uh, okay. Yeah, there have been. I've I've had some good. Some of them are working with these at-risk kids and mm-hmm. figuring out how to work through some of the 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 muck. I mean, uh, hard one experience. Yeah, life one hundred and one yeah. teaches a lot. Yeah. And you know, I had my ways. I didn't realize as a kid, you know, the, the horse thing how I could leave the house and go ride for a couple hours and come back and feel like I could conquer the world. Oh, there you go. That mm-hmm. is yeah. a great uh, way to that get was, out. Yeah. That was the rhythmic motion of the horse. That was the getting out and being able to be in the outdoors. It was to be, you had a non-judgmental listener there that you could actually talk sure. to. It wasn't going to give any opinions. Yeah, mm-hmm. you could talk and, to for two hours straight and never get tired. Yeah, you that'd work be it out. great. But most of it was just being quiet and the writing. And I didn't know as far as I didn't grow up with knowing anything about any of this. And the trauma focused Hmm. training, when I went through that, that was like, huh, how about that? Oh, that's why that worked. Oh, that's cool. You learn new words to put on it. Yeah. It's like, oh, goodness. Okay. So I was like a giddy kid, you know, at this training going, Huh, how about that? <laughs> you know, everything that huh. made sense, you know, the yeah. things that you knew brought that peace or that you knew mm-hmm. brought the ability to handle the tough things that were going on around you Yeah. without you losing your cool or, or turning into something that, you know, I could have been a really not so good kid if I'd wanted to be. Yeah. Yeah. It gives you the tools to go, you know, choose good or evil. Kind Absolutely. Of thing. 
that how to how to how to be in a situation and how to how to how to handle it. I don't say manipulate it, but how to mm-hmm. how to handle it so that to the benefit of everybody without taking it without getting upset yourself without yeah. uh, taking having it a goal and a path because yeah. that was something I planned pretty pretty young age too was where I wanted to go how was it, how was I going to get there how was I going to afford to get there and got really you. creative. Yeah. And uh, was able to achieve whatever I chose to do. That's the real secret, isn't it? I wish I'd have been more more targeted in my goals uh, younger sometimes, not always. But it makes it easier if you've got a plan and then you just then you're just clever in how you get it done. Um, that's uh, I think that's good advice for almost anybody, especially necessity. Young people creates yeah. a lot of things yes yes and it's whether you say, I think a pity party and stay in your group or whether you are going to follow that and <laughs> take a risk and say okay if it doesn't work it doesn't work but i'm going to do it anyway yeah. i'm going to yeah. see if this works out yeah. take the risk on yourself you know with yourself trust yourself and i think you were forced into that a little bit claudette because you my dad was the youngest of five, and I believe you were the oldest sibling in your house. Oh, okay. Um, and so I imagine that your upbringing and sibling order placement being so different hmm. shaped a lot of your, because you ended up um, pretty much raising your youngest sister. Yeah. Is that right? Well, I took care of her until I left the house. We were uh, 17 years apart, the little, yeah. the youngest yeah. one. And she she and I are more like, we think more like, um, she's like a oldest only all over again and had a lot of chiefs in her mm-hmm. life and not yeah. Indians. Uh, very successful, wonderful. She's a corporate uh, business consultant. Oh, and nice. has a thriving business and is also getting ready to defend her dissertation. So she's wow. getting cool. her PhD. Very proud of her. Nice. Uh, when she was a little bitty, um, yeah, she. if people hadn't known us in this town we lived in, they would have sworn she was mine. Yeah. Uh, well, you raised her. Well, we there yeah. started, her, but to. then... It, you know, more or less. But it was yeah. only a year and a half later that I was then in and out because I three days after high school mm-hmm. I moved a hundred miles away from home and never moved back. Uh, okay. We okay. visited, well. but I I did to put my plan into play. Yep. Yeah. Understandably so. so, yeah. Interesting. Good for you. But I think that there is almost an unavoidable sense of responsibility that older kids end up having, um, typically, not always, but as the oldest sibling, the expectations end up being higher for you as the younger children come along and you learn, you know, just through default, how you learn a different level of responsibility just because like, oh, I'm five and they're a baby and I can change a diaper. Mm-hmm. So, and, and a lot of times older kids want to, they want to help with the younger kids and, and there's nothing wrong with that at all. Yeah. Um, but I think that older siblings end up coming out of childhood with a slightly if or significantly higher level of understanding about responsibility mm-hmm. than younger or young guest mm-hmm. who who never really had to like care for anyone else Mm -hmm. below them. Mm -hmm. Um, Yeah. It's just interesting. It's just sibling order fascinates me. It's one of (laughs) the most fascinating things for me to observe um, and, and see. So it's, but yeah, it changes your perspective. I mean, anything you do, whether it's parenting or foster parenting, you go in with expectations. I mean, you have thoughts before you've done it once. And then, then the education starts. You start doing it, and uh, you know. So first, first children always have always get that. Get all of that on the job that. training. Yeah. Right. <laughs> you know, by the time my parents got to me, 
I would disappear in the morning and uh, I was expected to be within whistle shot. My dad had a high pitched, you know, could whistle mm-hmm. loud and we would come home at the evening. You know, the first kids are were at least in my family were pretty tightly tightly reined and I just disappeared and ran around did what I want all day and came back they were right. fairly confident I wasn't going to die or back in those days be abducted like you know I mean all the Today's fears world. we yeah. have now is different time but yeah well, it's, it, it's, I mean it's not it's real though the human trafficking is is outrageous unbelievable yeah. yeah and so expectations and, and uh, are huge are huge in ourselves so we have to watch those yeah I'm proud of all my my siblings. You know, everyone is very good people. Very good. Did yeah, I? Don't, you know, don't know if I had a piece. And you know, we we think we did a lot, which we did, but they're their own individuals, and they've yeah. grown very much into themselves, and very proud yeah. of them. Yeah. Good. Good. Well, Claudette, what um. Tell us where, tell everybody where they can find you, um, the programs and services that you're, that you're currently offering. Um, and then we'll link all of that stuff in the show notes as well. Okay. Well, my website is powerfulperspectivecoaching.com. I do have several courses that are listed up there. I do one-on-one, um, 12, six, three-week programs. And uh, offer a gratitude challenge that's free. Another also Mm. for your group, I would like to do a special little workshop, like a two-hour little workshop um, for anyone interested. But if you go to my website, um, look up at the program, see what's available. That is the coaching end. On the on-premise site, the Equine Assisted Learning is a leadership and skills development program, and okay. we partner with those horses doing obstacle. It is from the ground. It is not a writing. It's not a control. Mm. It is mm. a partnership training. Okay. And that is Osborne Stables Equine Rescue.org. And you can take a look at the programs we offer, which are everything from corporate family at risk and those proceeds do go directly to the horses. Well, awesome. but that's, but that's educational running all that. Yeah. It's, it's a neat program. I have one other facilitator that I had trained and it is a program where, you know, you don't use volunteers in this program. Uh, they need to know how to watch the horse and the body language. Mm hmm and how to um, get people to parallel that back to what's going on with them and how, how that's working with their teams, mm-hmm. whether it's an individual person that you're working with or a, a team, which I like to do groups and teams on this. Because, yeah. you know, the disconnect sometimes in the team, you know, it Especially. brings out the families. It's wonderful because mm-hmm. there's one, it's kind of a take and give and, uh, an obstacle course that's really unique. It um, they get in there, they look at it, and they this is a piece of cake, and they can start to do this, and they're going, "What?" You know, <laughs> it's totally stopped. Mm-hmm. I mean, dead silence, looking in bewilderment. And there are eleven ways to do that exercise, but some of the the little station cards that say what they can and can't do, or mm-hmm. the horse can or can't do. Like uh, okay. weaving through the cones and pick the horse can't pick the flowers. Um, <laughs> you know, <laughs> kind of silly, but they're great programs. And it is to help people excel, move forward, bring that joy back into life so that you can live the life you want to live, one you were cut out to be and born to be. Yeah. Yeah. Learning, learning about yourself is often not easy, but it's very rewarding. You know, once you once you're past it, you say you don't take volunteers. You can't oh, use volunteers. The, um, no, only in the equine assisted learnings horse work. 
Well, and so I now, was going to volunteers. I, otherwise, oh yes, the rescue needs stall cleaners and people to scrub water buckets, and mm-hmm. you know, yes, always with volunteers. So there's a lot of room. But for it, people there's a to, difference between the programs and yeah. and having a trained facilitator. Yeah, yeah. Work I that. Uh, yes, the rescue needs volunteers all the time. Outstanding, outstanding, good. I may have to come uh, and look you up sometime when I'm down in Texas. Oh, great. Do so. Check the place out. That Introduce great. you to that 2,000 pound Pertron. Oh, my golly. <laughs> You'll love it. It'd be like is standing it, next to a truck. <laughs> his, his hooves are as big as a little smaller than dinner plates. Like a dinner plate, I'll bet. Yeah. Oh, my goodness. That sounds like fun. Yeah, it is. Well, this has well, been so much fun and just I've loved visiting. I love the way that you and Jennifer work together. Oh, thank you. That's, I, that's when I was listening to your podcast, I just absolutely love the interaction between the two of you. <laughs> you can, it's great. Yeah. yeah, we've had we've we've uh, been through some wars and and I think that's part of what like you know, fostering or uh, not therapy, but these coachings uh, that you do. It's uh, it comes of some experience. You know, that's when you see when you see people uh, uh, getting along together. Well, then that's uh, that's good experience. You know, that's that's a growth experience. So, well, without lost... having done that, would you be in the place you are today? Oh no, no. That re- yeah. that very much was was my my purpose in life was trying to figure out kids however imperfectly and uh uh, still still love working with kids i don't know what it is you know the giving you have to watch your expectations you know you have to do it because you you want to do it um it's uh it's a challenge it's it's not for everybody i suppose it should be can be for everybody it seems like i don't know maybe Oh, yeah. uh, some are going to be terminal children all their lives. You know, yeah. may not quite. <laughs> don't know. Well, I thank you for coming. I don't know. Did we lose Jennifer? I can't see Jennifer anymore. I can't either. So I okay. didn't know if I the camera know. just stepped out for a few minutes. But well, we may just be chatting here then. But it's really been great to to meet you and get to know you. And I hope I hope we get to meet in person. Oh, me too. What you're doing sounds really, really worthwhile. It's just been really good talking to you. Thank you, Claudette. Well, it was nice visiting with you both. I hope you have an absolutely wonderful start to your new year. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Well, did you learn anything new? Or have you heard all of this before? Do you agree with us? Disagree with us? Have a question? We want to see you in our inbox or via the Patreon page in the show notes. Tap on either link to send us your feedback, share your own parenting story, or support our mission of providing a connected community for all parents. And don't forget to hit subscribe so you never miss an episode. If you loved this episode, click on that little star and give us five of them so we can get visible to other parents who are looking for us. This is your weekly reminder. Parents, you already have everything you need inside of you. You are a strong, loving, capable parent. And here, you are never alone. I'll see you next week.